write a cantata about an abstraction. That's the challenge faced by Bach and his anonymous librettist in creating a work for the 21st Sunday after Trinity, and that fell in the year 1723, Bach's first in Leipzig, on October 17th. So we are within just a few days of the precise 300th anniversary of this work, that is, of the first performance of today's piece, Ich glaube, lieber Herr, hilft mein Unglauben, wie der 109. The liturgical anniversary, if you're interested in such things, is actually next Sunday on the 29th. The abstraction involved comes from the gospel reading for the day. It's the story of a royal official who asks Jesus to visit and to heal his mortally ill son. Jesus tells him on the spot that his son is healed. The official returns home to find that this is in fact true. And the story tells us he, the official, and his entire household believe. This belief or faith is the central concept of the cantata. In German, it's the uh, uh, Glaube, belief or faith, and the verb Glauben, to believe or to have faith. And this is part of this cantata text from the very first line of the first movement, Ich Glaube, lieber Herr, lieber Herr, to the last line of the last movement, Er hilft seinen Gläubigen alle. The opposite of faith is, of course, faithlessness, and that's mentioned again in the first movement, hilft meinem Unglauben. This, un this lack of faith is also characterized as doubt, Zweifel. Uh, movement three uh, begins uh, wie Zweifelhaftig, and uh, in movement four, the singer refers to uh, pull yourself together, du Zweifelhafte Mut, uh, you uh, doubting disposition. So in this work, we have a conflict in the text between faith and doubt. Faith is, of course, a central concept of Lutheran thought. It's faith, not actions, that were said to be the only way to obtain otherwise unmerited salvation through Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice. Doubt was central as well to Lutheran thought, but both of these concepts, faith and doubt, are completely abstract. They are difficult to translate into music. And the job of the cantata libretto and of its musical setting, I would say, is to make these abstract concepts accessible and to communicate them in an effective way to the listener. And the solution to this problem of setting an abstract concept to music starts with the way the text deals with these themes. The opening movement, of course, introduces the concept of faith, and the passage there is from Mark's Gospel. It's on faith, but it's a little cryptic. I have faith, help my faithlessness. Now, a commentary from a Bible that Bach owned explains that this is to be understood as meaning, my faith is so weak, I have faith, but my faith is so weak that it can be regarded as faithlessness. Now, it's telling that the chosen scriptural passage to open this cantata, um, which directly introduces the conflict between faith and faithlessness, is not from the day's gospel reading. It's on this topic of faith, which, as I mentioned, is, is discussed in the Gospel reading, but it was chosen specifically to begin this cantata, and it was chosen presumably for this very feature of its opposing faith and faithlessness, and that contrast, really any kind of contrast, lends itself well to a musical setting. Even more importantly in the libretto, the concept of faith here is linked with hope, hoffnung, and the concept of doubt goes together with fear, forced. So you have faith, faithlessness on the one hand, but you have um, hope and fear on the other as parallel concepts. And the libretto contrasts uh, hope and faith. In number three, how fraught with doubt is my hope. And in number five, when their hope lies helpless. And the conflict is taken up um, in, uh, in various places in the cantata, including in the recitative number two, um, where there are alternating couplets, alternating pairs of lines that, that switch between confidence in God's help, and help here is to be understood as salvation, on the one hand, and fear and doubt on the other. Ah, no, the recitative says three times. The aria number three, in fact, describes this wavering between fear, hope, on the one hand, and uh, between faith and hope, rather, on the one hand, and doubt and fear on the other. The rest of number four that I just read you reassures the listener through Jesus. The aria number five celebrates the triumph of faith, and this is all confirmed by the chorale text number six. 
So in this libretto, the topic of belief, unbelief, becomes one of hope and fear. And hope and fear have the advantage for the composer and the poet of being affected. That is, they describe human emotions. And that means that the concept of this cantata are now expressed in terms ideally suited to the principal tool used by 18th century composers. And that is to compose music that moves the affections, that moves the feelings of the listeners. And so you can see that this abstract concept has been translated into something that really lends itself to setting to music. It's arrayed in a very telling way. There's a recit and aria on fear, numbers two and three, and then there's a recit and aria on faith, number four and five. And it's not difficult to see this as dramatized in the cantata text. You have a recit and aria in the voice of fear, and I say that's fear with a capital F as an allegorical character, and then a pair in the voice of hope, an allegorical representation, personification of hope. The libretto construction thus sets the stage, and the opening movement introduces this idea of contrast and conflict between faith and faithlessness. The recitative number two alternates between hope and fear, the wavering of the heart that's named in movement three. Now, movements one and two interestingly add another element, and that is that movements one or two are effectively both pleas for help, for assistance, Assistance In number one, help my faithlessness, is the second half of the statement. And the very end of the recitative number two asks in a most pleading way, ah, Lord, how long? Recit number four is the turning point. It invokes, invokes Jesus and promises salvation as the solution to doubt. This is where the day's gospel is invoked. It says, because Jesus still now is performing wonders, that refers to a lot line in the day's reading in which Jesus says, if you do not see signs and wonders, you do not believe. The aria number five is effectively contrasting to number three as well. If you read the text of the two, you'll see how well opposed they are. And this is uh, another part of what the librettist does to set the composer up. So what does Bach do with this? He takes up both this conflict introduced in the first movement and what I might call the affective translation of the abstract idea of belief into one of hope and fear. First of all, he reinforces the sense of dialogue between fear and hope. In fact, there are two other Bach church cantatas whose texts are explicitly allegorical dialogues between fear and hope. It says across the top of Bach's score, dialogue, dialogos, and it labels the two voices, hope and fear. There's a strong hint of this, I would say, in Bach's setting of this cantata text. The opening and closing movements call for four voices, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, but unusually only two of those voices are used for solo numbers here, a recit aria pair for tenor and a recit aria pair for alto. Now, pairs like this are common in other kinds of vocal instrumental pieces of Bach's time and in Bach's repertory, but not so much in church cantatas. Now, our cantata is not called a dialogue in any of its sources, nor, as far as we can tell, are its voices assigned character names. But it's not hard to see this model invoked in Bach's musical choices here. The cantata's topical progression moves from fear to hope, presented by a singer who all but represents fear, followed by one who all but represents hope. Bach musically illustrates doubt as well, and the wavering part mentioned in, in the aria number three. The text of the recit, number two, as I mentioned, alternates couplets of assurance and doubt. Every other pair begins with, ah, no. The poet shows the doubt, the lack of faith, within one character. Right? This is fear, who tries to be confident, but uh, doubt uh, wavers and drags this character back. Bach sets it as a recitative, but what's really interesting is that the alternating phrases of hope and fear are marked forte and piano in the vocal line, most unusually. This is vanishingly rare in recitatives. I can't think of any other examples in Bach. Bach wants to make sure you hear the repeated sudden contrast, hope and fear and hope and fear and hope and fear, by making a dynamic contrast in the voice. Bach also makes the clearest possible affective distinction between the two arias. With their relatively, with their affectively contrasting text. Number three is in a minor key, in a duple meter. It's scored for strings and tenor. Number five is in a major key. It's in a triple meter. It's scored for oboes and alto. 
Number three is music of agitation and restlessness with startling dissonances and a tortured vocal line. If you know the aria Ach mein Sinn from Bach's St. John Passion, this is a direct relative of that aria. Number five, on the other hand, is a graceful dance with regular phrasing and a consonant singable tune. It does have a long B section in its A, B, A construction, and that B section does contrast with the music I just described when flesh and spirit contend with each other. There's another conflict, another contention. But that, to my ear, makes the return to the opening music, the music of the A section, feel all calm. And Bach offers framing movements for these recitatives and arias that present two different approaches to this contrast between faith and doubt, hope and fear. The opening movement is based on one of Bach's longest and most complex instrumental ritornellos. Now, a ritornello is the basis of a movement like this, or of a concerto, or a movement, as I say, like this, that is constructed like one. This ritornello includes a concerto element within itself, that is, within the instrumental ritornello, before the voices even ever come in, there's a textural contrast of the whole ensembles on the one hand and just the two oboes and violin on the other. So this element or contrast of contrast or even conflict between the two different sized ensembles um, is built into the ritornello. And you might know that one of the senses that concerto was understood to have in the 18th century was as forces contending with each other. It's not the only thing. It also paradoxically means to join together harmoniously, but it does mean to contend with each other. And that's built into the ritornello here. Um, the movement is constructed from opening and closing full ritornello statements, and then three vocal statements of the text, and then with shortened ritornellos to punctuate each of those. So the usual alternation of ritornello and vocal episode. Each vocal statement is, in fact, designed to bring out the contrast within that text. The third is a little bit different, but the first two, you can hear this most clearly. A solo voice declares, I have faith, dear Lord, and then that's echoed and reinforced by all four voices. And then a solo voice sings the entire text, I have faith, dear Lord, help my faithlessness. And then the second part of the text, help my faithlessness, is echoed and greatly expanded on by all four voices. So a statement of faith, a statement of the entire text which embodies that conflict, and then a long statement of the second part, the contrasting part, which is also the plea for help. So the contrasting elements here on the outside are both separated and joined in that middle statement and brought out by the presentation by solo voice. You will notice, I think, the domination of the second part, help my faithlessness, and by the frequent interjections of just the one syllable, help, help, hilf, hilf, really very striking. As I mentioned, there's a similar plea at the end of the recitative number two, ah, Lord, how long, which is said in a frankly tortured arioso, uh, an aria-like setting. So the opening movement presents the conflict between faith and doubt three times in a musically serious context. The final movement is the expected chorale stanza, and it's chosen for relevance to the cantata topic. Here, I would say, for its first and last lines. The first line, whoever hopes in God, well, there's that term, and that's tied to the fear-hope contrast. And then the very last line, he, God, helps all who have faith. So you can see how this chorale stanza was understood to fit the context very well. Now, many, many of Bach's cantatas end with a simple chorale harmonization, but Bach goes well behind, beyond a simple harmonization in this movement. It's a full concerted piece with chorale phrases embedded in a ritornello concerto. It's a serious, agitated ritornello full of prominent dissonance and tension-building passages that build over, up over a sustained bass note. To my ear, it's the most exciting feature of this ritornello. It's not difficult, I think, to hear this, too, as an invocation of conflict and contention. The progress of the cantata text is from fear to hope, and that stands. And it does progress, as you can read, from fear, doubt, wavering, unbelief, to confidence and hope and belief at the end. But the challenge to the believer represented by doubt and the internal conflict that comes with that doubt remains, and Bach reminds the listener of that uh, in that last one.
Yeah, it's 